I think we'll probably just get started. A uh, shout out to our audience <laughs> here. Uh, very robust, yay, women in medicine. Okay, awesome. But um, well, welcome to our session. This is called Breaking the Glass Ceiling by Sending Down a Ladder. And this is an AWEM sponsored um, event, and we're really um, thankful for their support. We're going to do introductions in just a second, so, but we'll kind of jump into this. So we have no disclosures, of course. And so we're going to do, you know, how many of you guys have been to those mentorship talks where, you know, we talk about like, you know, these are the characteristics, this is kind of what you should look for, this is how you leverage it. Um, anyone been to those talks, right? We're going to try to mix it up just a little bit by actually making this a didactic plus a panel discussion because I think all of us here on the panel, we've had different degrees of mentorship in our lives and some worked really great and then we do want to pause and talk about the times it did not work as well. And so that's really important. And especially because um, we're talking about breaking the glass ceiling. So we'll talk about our path to medicine, the barriers that can exist, the different types of mentorship and support that exist. And then finally, we're going to challenge all of you to think about how can you actually support each other and others on their journey to medicine to really help to break those glass ceilings. So let's kind of meet our panelists. So I'll kind of start. I'm, I'm Serena Dacian. I'm one of the APDs at Duke. I'm very thankful to be part of the panel as well as one of the facilitators. And I'll definitely say these um, amazing women here and all of you in the audience also, um, they, but they've been really supportive in my own career and trajectory um, as being role models for me, mentors, allies. You'll see coaching. We'll talk about all those words, but I definitely see you know, the power of how that can really affect someone's life. And so I'm very thankful. And we'll kind of just walk down the, the line. Hi, I'm Teresa Chan. I'm at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and I am Associate Dean of Continuing Professional Development there. And uh, I'll pass it over to Dean. Hi, everybody. Jamie Jordan, one of the Associate Program Directors at UCLA and also our Director of Discovery. Hi, everyone. My name is Adara Landry. I'm an emergency medicine doc, obviously, at the Brigham, um, and, a, and a former Assistant Residency Director, but now I'm focusing more on medical school advising. So we'll kind of jump into this, you know, and we're all emergency medicine physicians, right? We know it gets very busy and challenging, you know, within the ED, but also life outside of the ED can feel the same way, you know, as we're thinking about what we're doing in academics and how we can kind of leverage that for promotions and so on. But I'll, I want to kind of start at the very beginning, you know, like I'm going to ask my panelists, you know, think about that path to medicine, you know, in which ways did it go as anticipated? You know, who were those people in your lives or those situations in your life that really kind of empowered you to kind of get to this point? I think the brainwashing in my family started very early um, and uh, my dad's a doc um, and I remember when I was like I was definitely under 10 cute enough to sit at the nursing station and not be too, super annoying um, I remember being given like backs of progress notes to like draw pictures on and the nurses would give me cookies and asked if I wanted to be a doctor or something like my dad. So that probably is. Yeah, I tried to fight it, but it didn't work very well. So I actually wanted to be a, a doctor since I was probably about five and started putting Band-Aids on my dolls and reading out of the Encyclopedia of Diseases. Um, and, and also suffer from a huge lack of mentorship and advice along the way because there wasn't anybody in my family who was in medicine and, and very few people who had actually even gone to college. So I made a lot of mistakes but still circuitously somehow managed to, to get there. Um, I was like a lukewarm pre-med in college and um, I actually witnessed a pretty dramatic medical experience or event when I was a college student with someone else, and that really shaped my um, my confidence in being a physician and really toward dedicating my life to helping people when they're in um, a very serious, vulnerable medical situation. So. Awesome, and you kind of see like the journey for all of you, and I definitely encourage you to think about your own journey, right? It looks very different, and, and really the importance is like thinking, you know, there is this pipeline that, you know, can make it a little bit more, you know, straight and narrow for, for people and to help them to have less, you know, turns along the way. But it gets really challenging if you're the first one going into medicine or even having the idea, are you good enough to go into medicine, right? So it gets very challenging. And I'll definitely say, like, I was late coming into EM. I actually thought I was going to be a trauma surgeon, uh, to put that out there. But um, I remember I just got put into an EM rotation. I was like, oh, so this is it. And one of my attendees came up to me. Um, and he was, he was like, this is what you're made for, right? And that planted the seed in my mind of, like, oh, maybe I should think about EM. So, you know, we call that the 
bright side of medicine, right? It's the patients we save, it's those you know, situations that we get a compliment, they seem few and far between some shifts, right? But uh, the times that we actually get to shine, and especially those mentors that bring, you know, lift us up, those family members, friends that lift us up to uh, reach that. But there is this other side of medicine, right? We call it kind of the dark side of medicine where you feel like you're suffocating. It can come in a lot of different forms, right? It can come in long work hours. It can come in the isolation, especially in the pandemic. We felt this a lot, um, which is why it's great to see faces in the audience here. Um, but really, it can also come in in the shape of like maybe a mentor that might, instead of being you know lifting you up, it might actually be tearing you down, right? And so I definitely want to you know pause and talk about this dark side of medicine. So we won't name any names or anything. But for my panelists, you know, what were some of those barriers to your journey into medicine and, um, you know, getting to this point? Was it a situation? Was it a test? Was it a, you know, a person? You know, what, what did that look like? I'll just say, like, one of my biggest barriers, I think, was not being able to find or, or knowing how to seek out good mentorship. Um, and I think consequentially, I, I didn't take advantage of some of the opportunities that were presented to me, and I, I did things totally wrong in terms of some of the application process and preparation. Um, and I really had to learn the hard way by making a lot of mistakes about uh, the, a more straightforward path to go. I think I got in my own way a little bit because I think um, I thought there was only one path to doing what I wanted to do someday, and I think that I put a lot of stress on myself and burnt myself out at an early age and learned how to deal with that earlier, like in third year of college, basically. Um, and I think in retrospect, that was good, because I think that a lot of the strategies I learned that year, I apply now, and you know, I think I'm better for it, but you know, you, you see that at the time, getting like 62 in microbiome, being, you know, not, you know, a huge, it's, it's a big deal back then, you know, it's less of a deal now. I think the, in addition to what you both said, I think for me, um, I had this misconception that mentorship would find me or support would find me and I was like very hesitant to go out and, and introduce myself to other people and tell them what my needs are, my interests are and to try to set up relationships and build those relationships and really try to take responsibility for my own career path. That happened much, much, much later, I would say. Um, if I had thought about th this career and journey being something that I can direct myself by going out and finding the people who I really need in my life, then I think I would have reached my goals much faster, for sure. Yeah, you really see, you know, we're kind of planting the seed of like why mentorship is so important is that, you know, some of these barriers can get very challenging. I'll definitely say, you know, some of the, the mentors I've had in my life, you know, I, I thought were well-intentioned, but some of the wording wasn't helpful, right? Like, you should stay a nurse. I used to be a nurse, so I am always a nurse at heart. So, but, you know, maybe, you know, don't think about medicine. Think about just staying as a nurse or, you know, things like that that are not very helpful that can really feed into what we'll talk about in just a second, imposter syndrome that pops up. But, you know, but we talk about, the, you know, the terminology of, like, sticky floors. I don't know if anyone's heard that term before, but basically it's like you're trying to move forward, but you're stuck, right? Your leg's stuck and you can't move it because it's basically something that's keeping you stuck in that position instead of moving forward in your career. This also kind of leads to the second term, a glass ceiling. And I think this actually we we probably are all familiar with, right? It's just that you have the talent, the skills, the expertise to, to reach that next step of promotion, but there's like the ceiling effect that you can't break through and it keeps you in that position. We definitely see this in, in a lot of aspects of medicine, but I would even like challenge us to think outside of medicine as well too. There are glass ceilings and sticky floors for so many people in our, in our communities. We see this definitely for women in medicine, but we also see this for our, our underrepresented in medicine colleagues and, and medical students, and even all through from elementary school all the way through their careers, they might not even think about medicine because of those sticky floors or glass ceilings or just even not even knowing that this was a, a option for them. And so I like to say for a lot of my like, you know, patients that come in with their children, I was like, you have a future doctor in your hands, right? When they're like grabbing at my stethoscope because it's like planting a seed, like they can do anything they want to, right? Why should the society kind of keep them trapped in, you know, these ideas? But the imposter syndrome really is what feeds into that. And I think we've all kind of fallen victim to this like never enough kind of disease, right? Not good enough, not smart enough, not talented enough to do things. So I wanted to ask my panelists, um, you know, what are your experience? Have you had imposter syndrome? I think all of you guys should not have that at all, but how has this affected your lives? 
I think I still struggle with this to this day, uh, constantly, just even being here with all of you, it just feels like I'm maybe not ready, not skilled, haven't practiced enough, don't deserve to be here. And I think it's something that we have to recognize is probably more common than we think and finding ways to you know, encourage ourselves, promote ourselves, recognize the skills and talents that we have and also look for that in, in others. Because I, I didn't know exactly how how vast the problem was until I started, you know, being vulnerable and opening up, and then I found that, oh, hey, I'm, I'm not the only one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I am conflicted on this concept of imposter syndrome, I'll be quite honest, because I think it's thrown out way too much and people misuse it, and um, um, so sometimes I do feel unprepared, but I don't necessarily feel like I'm an imposter. And so like teasing out the nuances of what that word implies, which is like feeling fraudulent, feeling like you were tricking other people. I, I don't feel, feel like I ever do that, but of course there are some days where I feel like there's clearly concepts or things that I don't know that I need to know, but I don't feel necessarily like an imposter. I also feel like there's so many external barriers that are pointed inward towards all of us that make us feel unsupported or make us feel unwanted. And then we start to internalize all of those external forces. And, and, and I think that sort of makes us feel like, well, maybe I am a fake. But for me personally, when I think back, let's say, to medical school or residency, probably more so medical school where I didn't have a mentor and a lot of folks around me did, I, I, I almost felt like I had all of this potential to be really great at something, but no one else cared. And someone told me, oh, well, you just have imposter syndrome. I was like, no, I don't feel fake. I just feel like everything around me, the environment in which I practice is actually not nurturing. <laughs> and it was sort of like victim blaming in, in a way. So I just want to make sure that people are thoughtful. And, and I really encourage everyone to go back and read the original papers on imposter syndrome because you might realize I actually don't have it. Yeah, I think that's a great framing, actually, because it, it's, sometimes it's a lack of inclusive environment, right? That really actually is the problem. It's more of an environmental issue than actually the, the, the person issue, but especially depending on the, the person, they might actually internalize it as a problem with themselves, right, and not realize that it, actually they have the qualification and the skills, right? It's just that the environment that was tr promised things and, you know, was supposed to build them up actually is tearing them down. Yeah, yoga mats don't fi fix wellness. And, uh, and telling someone they have imposter syndrome doesn't fix the system that's broken. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I will say that the term imposter syndrome is interesting after reading the literature originally, but also actually just realizing that it's probably misnamed to begin with because imposters actually, they know they're fake, but they act like they belong. And then wrestling with that terminology of how, actually it's the fake it like you, Fake, fake it till you make it, that's actually impostering, right? And so I think that sometimes, like, understanding how you can actually be tactical about moving in a way towards the things that you think you should belong to, you can actually activate yourself more to say, I may not have every qualification I need, but I'm 90% there. It's not 62, so it's good, right? Like, I can move through this and I can, I, can, I can actually showcase what I have and see if that's good enough, right? Um, because a lot of people, like a lot of literature shows, women tend to wait till we have like 110% mm -hmm. before we, you know, go for that leadership role. And instead, why not be a bit of an imposter, mm -hmm. but not let anyone know that I am and go when I have the 80 or 90% readiness, right? And I, I get those jobs sometimes, and then I have to then do the MBA to backfill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and definitely this is attractive, yeah. So if you have questions, please. What? And I'll kind of just repeat the question just so it's on the recording. But, you know, definitely I think residency is a time that oftentimes we feel like it's imposter syndrome, but maybe the, you know, environment maybe is not nurturing us. So the question is, like, how can we actually facilitate that, you know, for others? Sometimes I feel like it's just asking questions, 
right? Getting to know individuals, asking them what they need, what they are, where interests are, what they think would actually facilitate their growth. Um, because a lot of times there are a lot of simple things that we can do that we may not have thought of or have been overlooked that can really be beneficial to those coming behind us. I think you also, when someone's coming to you with something very sensitive and personal and they're being vulnerable, I think starting from a place of trusting their, their experience or their perception of the experience is true to them is really important because a lot of times we feel like we can mitigate stress by um, telling them, I don't think that's what's happening. I think actually they are well intended. They're actually a really good person. That actually makes someone feel worse. Like I, now I'm now I'm exaggerating. Now I'm dramatic. Now I'm this and this and this. And so um, I think it's really important just to start from a place of listening and believing their perspective. Just understand that, they, that their perspective is true to them. And I think it's about role modeling your own vulnerability and allowing people to see that you're trucking through, even though you haven't got everything figured out, that you role model, that you have a growth mindset, if you have a knowledge deficit, you, you, you I think you have to show the rough drafts of yourself to other people. Uh, I do that with my writing, right? Like, I'm, I'm co cool with a med student coming along and rewriting a sentence that I know wasn't the best sentence, because that allows them to feel like they've really contributed, right? And so similarly, I think if we present this perfect, and I think we do this as women more than more than our male colleagues, like um, possibly we want to make sure we're impressive, we want to make sure we're putting our best foot forward, and we come off as these perfect people, and that makes it really intimidating for someone behind you to ever aspire to be like you. I think that when you do some pratfalls and show that your hair is a little bit, you know, going the wrong direction once in a while, and these two are probably, they're all, they always look great, but I, I do not, like, and I sometimes have food on my shirt, and that's just the way it is, and, you know, and I'll just apologize for it, make a joke, and then move on, right? So I think that being yourself, being authentic, being able to put that out there is actually really important to make it seem achievable, and I think that inclusivity comes from being, be, but from seeing people like you, and that might not just be the phenotype, but it might also be personality type. You know, our dean is super polished. I'm like, I am not like him at all, right? But my chair is like super like me, and he, even though he's a white guy, like it's like our personalities, he's always talking a mile a minute, like getting things wrong sometimes, but then backfilling and, and getting it right, you know? And so I think that having people that are like you out there and normalizing that is important. Also, I'm going to let Dr. Landry kind of take over for the next section. Um, thanks, Shree. I, I think it's really important to think about where your heart is in medicine and, and where your passion originated and how that is um, tied to your day-to-day -day practice and your day-to-day -day responsibilities at work. So for me, I think back to when I was a medical st student and I was um, actually quite interested in urology. And I will tell you like the main reason why I didn't go into urology is I didn't feel welcomed there. Not that people were overtly rude or sexist or ageist or racist or anything like that, but I just didn't feel like they took an interest in my interest in the field. And um, because of that, I sort of washed it away as an as a option. Not because I didn't love the specialty or I didn't love the patient care or the research or the future of the field, but just because the people around me on that single rotation made me feel like I probably won't fit into this larger field that expands beyond that entire clinic that I was just in. Isn't that crazy? That one small experience like that can shape someone's entire life. And um, so when I did my uh, rotation in emergency medicine later, the first faculty member who I saw, or who I remember seeing, maybe there were some before her, but was um, a black woman who um, was amazing, and she told me that for that month, she was gonna walk me through how to succeed in this rotation. And it was just like a vast, just, just a remarkable difference, right? And I ended up going into the field, loving it, and I have no regrets, I'm glad I, I'm glad I chose emergency medicine. But I always think back to that moment where someone made me feel welcome and what that meant to me, and that really drives me to make other people feel that same way. And I think it's important to have these sorts of moments of reflection because burnout is real, 
And um, it is, I think, something that we're all at risk of having if, we don't, if you don't already have it. So it's really important to think about what are the emotional ties that you have to the field? What is it that brings you purpose? What is it that keeps you going? And so for me, it's that connectedness, the ability to, to relate to others, to make them feel welcome. But also the ability for, for me to seek those things out too and have that need or that desire fulfilled. So for me, I'm looking for you know, both. And there are um, you know, various types of support that are available to you. And I think it's really important to know that it's not all just like mentorship. We use that word as like a wastebasket term, but there's a lot more nuance in, in the way we build relationships, the way we connect with others. So you might have heard the term coaching, for instance, and that is, we'll, um, we'll go into more detail into what that is, but you know, that's one way where you're learning a finite skill. There's advising, where someone's directing you into a particular direction. There's mentorship, which is this like to and fro, back and forth dialogue or, or dynamic that you have with someone, and sometimes you give and sometimes you take. Um, there's allyship, where you are perhaps privileged in one particular arena and you're helping someone who is not as privileged. And there's sponsorship, which is like, to me, the holy grail of someone really helping you get to where they are and, and trying to really escalate and skyrocket your career by naming your name and, uh, or, or nominating you. And then there's this mastermind or group mentoring or peer mentoring. You might have heard all these comments where, or um, terminology where you can work with people who are on the same plane with you and you guys discuss things together and, and, and problem solve together. All of these supports are out there for you. And it's really important to think about what is it that I lack and what is it that I need and, and how can it be solved? Because it might not just be mentorship. The benefits of really understanding um, the, um, the, the benefit of finding support um, or the, the value of finding support is that it can really help grow your career very quickly once you start to network. My favorite phrase um, that, I, that I heard from someone years ago is that um, really we should focus on um, connections and not commitments. And I know in medicine we think about all of our commitments, right? We're a director of this, dean of this, professor of this, but really the most successful people I know are the most networked people I know. So always trying to think about how can I grow my network, how can I meet other people and learn from other people is really important. It allows you to collaborate, right? Like Teresa Chan is the perfect example of someone who collaborates all the time, writes very quickly because of that. You can also mentor other people and become like have access to mentoring your friends. And I think a lot of it is about this like creating this culture of safety and feeling like you have a safe place to go with your needs. Um, and and I think as you start to you know build your network and meet other people, you can find out about other opportunities that you might not have heard of, and then say, oh, I didn't know that that was even possible, right? Like if I ask my daughter who is five years old, what does she want to be? Her answer is always going to be a doctor because that's all she knows, right? She's never going to list architect because she's never even heard of that profession, right? So by networking with other people, you learn about so many other opportunities. Now, of course, there are challenges, right? There's time. We're all busy. Getting onto someone's calendar is very tough. Um, I want to acknowledge that. <laughs> so I also want to make sure that you guys know that you know there's like hierarchy at play, and, and it's sometimes intimidating to reach out to folks. Um, there's like the whole process of getting onto someone's schedule and then staying on their schedule and coordinating these meetings. The lack of context, they might not know you or your perspective or what your needs are, so they might be nervous about committing. There's just like this whole um, risk of personalities clashing, and what do I do if the relationship isn't actually productive because their work ethic is very different than mine. They're type A, I'm type B. Um, and then also just like the content, like what you actually need from a content standpoint, they might not know the answers to. So that's why I think it's really important to like diversify, right? We talk about diversification in fi personal finance all the time in your portfolio, but also in like your personal network, super important to have people from different stages, different um, um, regions of the country, um, different interests, right? Teresa mentioned it al already, like you don't have to have um, faculty members who are your mentors who look like you. Like, that, it doesn't ha all have to be that way. In the beginning, I start that way because I feel like that per creates a very nice form of safety for me. But now that I feel like I have that, I, I have expanded to people who are in, you know, outside of emergency medicine, outside of medicine. And, and I have mentors who are just my mentors for personal finance or for developing a family. And so thinking about it as you can, you can sort of fragment all of your needs and it becomes very easy to see like, I need someone who's gonna help me with this one particular solution. So I'm gonna find someone who's really good at that one particular solution once you start working that way. I think now Dr. Jordan. Yes. 
All right, so now we're just gonna talk a little bit more about each of these specific types of relationships that might be beneficial to you in your careers. And the first being coach. Um, so this is somebody who really is going to help improve your performance, typically about a specific thing. And they're gonna do this by having these sessions where you'll have some active listening, some proactive questioning, and maybe some back and forth discussion in terms of what are some actionable steps that you can seek to improve. There's also a couple of different formats that you might think about this. So there's coaching in the moment, and this includes real-time observation and feedback, again, with those practical, actionable steps for how to improve your performance. We can also see coaching over time, and this, again, is gonna often take place outside of the clinical environment, and those observations that you're gonna use are gonna be based on a compilation of learner performance data. Then we also have mentorship. And I think in comparison to coaching, um, this is gonna be more longitudinal relationships and it's really gonna be more focused on the holistic development of the mentee rather than a specific performance task. Um, mentors are typically going to be your trusted advisors, right? They're gonna have a little bit more experience in that area that you're seeking mentorship on and they're gonna give you advice and give you guidance um, often through these back and forth discussions and periodic meetings. All right, allyship. So allies are folks who proactively support you in your career development. Right? They might be your colleagues, they might have similar job tasks as you, but they're someone who's going to advocate on your behalf, be supportive of your goals and ambitions, um, and then reinforce the good work that you do to others around you in your environment. All right, sponsorship. So sponsorship, these folks are your ultimate career champions, right? They are folks that are going to use their experience, knowledge, connections to help you find those opportunities that are gonna propel you further on your career trajectory. So I can say, like, just reflecting on my own personal experience, when I was a fellow, my fellowship director was one of the most fantastic sponsors that I ever could have wished for. Um, she really advocated for me to be part of national committees, to take place in the SAM Consensus Conference, gave me opportunities to participate in editorial review, and really just introduced me to folks who had the power to actually positively impact my career trajectory. All right, mastermind groups. Is anybody here part of a mastermind group? Have you heard of mastermind groups? Okay. These, these are really fantastic. So these are typically composed of either peer or new, near peer members. Um, and they utilize things like brainstorming, education, right, peer accountability to really promote growth, both personally and professionally, for all of their members. And I think the really nice thing about this type of format is it just allows for these really like open and candid discussions. So you can talk about things like your struggles, right? Like your insecurities, as well as your aspirations. And it really is fruitful for everyone in the group. All right, so now we're gonna to come to another question for our panel. So how have these types of relationships really helped you in your careers? I definitely think like there's a, a role for each, actually all of these types and for each of us in our lives, right? You can't just stick with like having only a mastermind group and having that be sufficient or only a coach, right? I think definitely um, it's good to have actually a mix of all of these types and having a diverse actually group of people being, you know, in that, in those roles as well can really help you out. So I can definitely say like a test for myself. Um, meet, you know, some of the most influential people in my lives are actually not from my own home institution, although I do have that as well too, but actually from different parts of the country and stuff, just so I can really, you know, be able to talk to them about, you know, issues that are coming up or ask for expertise and how to learn different skills or opportunities. So it really um, has definitely helped to like open doors. Even, I remember my first time speaking at CORD, I had submitted for three years in a row, great ideas. I saw those titles used in other talks, so I knew that they were being done, right? So I was like, this is a good idea, but they had never heard about me, like, talking at all. And it wasn't until I had reached out to one of my, my friends now, but mentors at that time, and he had just said to me, he was like, put my name on the talk. He was like, you're gonna do the talk, I'm gonna be there as your support person, but he was like, put my name on the talk because they know that they know me. And as soon as I did that, all those talks got submitted. And so that's how I've been paying it forward now is finding you know, junior uh, faculty who wanna speak on the national stage and being like, 
here, now they know me because I'm part of committees now and all of this stuff, and let me be an ally or sponsor for you. And so put my name on, <laughs> on your talks and then can help mentor them through the actual like process, coach them as they're presenting to become really exceptional at that. So that's ways that we can also like use that to pay it forward as well. Um, I, I actually have benefited from professional executive coaching um, and I've had that a couple of times and I do think that it's nice to have someone who has no skin in the game in the way that you do and can see things from a very different vantage point because I think sometimes you're just too stuck in the mud to really know which way is out and having someone that can zoom out um, and help you zoom out can be very helpful. Um, it's also nice because they're not part of the drama and they can just listen and that's very helpful um, and they're not like your partner who will try to solve it for you. Because I love him, but sometimes he just wants to be a hero, and my coach will not do that. My coach has a lot of training to s spin it back at me, and like, so what do you think the solution is? And and that's actually really important because it makes me and helps me activate myself back into a action um, after doing the oh woe is me. I think all of the types have helped me for sure, and I've used them all. I, I've had I've had a coach too, and. It was an amazing experience, um, a professional coach, and um, I have had someone who has functioned more as an advisor where I go to them and I have a very finite question and they tell me exactly how to solve it. Um, and there's not as much of a to or fro, they're like, you need to do this. Um, but I will say, if I, had to, if I had to pick which one I think is the most valuable, it would probably be for me, sponsors. And, and, and being a sponsor and, and being sponsored, because um, that is, it's, it's just a small, even a small mention of someone's name can open so many doors for them. And I think back to how I even met, um, how I got involved with, with Alien and, and Teresa Chan and all, of, and all of those wonderful folks. It was just someone put me on a, a small workshop like many moons ago. And there I met Michelle Lynn and I got, and she took me in under her wing and she gave me this great opportunity. But it wasn't because, it was just because that one person invited me to a workshop that I had that one conversation. So um, to me, that has the biggest impact with, which is pro with probably the lowest effort by just mentioning someone's name. Yeah, and I think actually our keynote speaker, you know, the first day, Dr. Heron, actually did that so beautifully, right? Because she had the stage for that time. But very much, if you, you take a step back and just watch the talk, it very much is like being a sponsor and like amplifying other people's works, right? She had the videos of you know different members of our community doing amazing things and really letting them speak about it and share it. And that to me, when I was watching that, I was like, that's what a leader looks like. It's someone who's amplifying and sponsoring and being an ally to others to amplify their work. And that was like, to me like something, a great example of all the different types of mentorship or support that we talk about was just watching that, that keynote. Well, so you actually kind of answered this next question. So I'm gonna change it up a little bit and just talk about maybe if you can enlighten us as to what challenges you've encountered on either establishing or maintaining some of these supportive relationships or any other hurdles you might have dealt with along the way? I think the expectations probably is the, the, the main one that I've seen and also the timing because you can imagine like depending on who you're asking to be you know, a sponsor or a mentor or, or whichever role, a coach, uh, everyone's busy in academics and that for me I think is is the challenge is getting onto their calendar or also having an expectation because sometimes when you're meeting with that person it ends up being like an hour meeting but you're just like chit-chatting and you actually didn't get what accomplished what you had wanted to do or ask or get advice about right and so it's just being kind of strategic in that you know just so that you can actually make sure that it's serving your needs but also like helping them as well. Um. Yeah, I, I think probably the, the hardest part, um, and I'm thinking back to where I struggled in the beginning of trying to build a network, was I would just go to people and say, can we meet? And, um, and they might have been more confused about what the purpose of the meeting was, and therefore they wouldn't know how much time they would need or what they need to prepare for. So over time, I've become more um, directed with like the question I have for someone. And I think then it makes it easier for them to say, yes, I'm the person to answer this, or no, I am not. And um, so I think a lot of self-reflection helps with me to discover what it is that I wanna do, what are my gaps to get there, 
who are the people who could actually fill those gaps and are they likely to be available and, and, and interested? And sort of that um, process has allowed me to meet people like, much quicker. I think that one of the challenges is knowing when a relationship is evolving or changing or maybe needs to stop. Um, at some point, um, mentorship can go awry, sponsorship can go awry. Um, and, and knowing when to bow out gracefully and give people, let them say face, or just maybe someone's not giving you what you need anymore because you've maxed out on what they could probably give you and converting that to more of a peer or a friendship, I think is okay as well. So letting things evolve. Um, sometimes, especially with residents, right? Like at some point they're, they're, they're just, they're just, awesome and you can just bask in the glory that you were helping them along the way and they've caught up to where you could no longer help them right like an example of that would be Michael Gottlieb I some point help him helped him write a paper or two he does not need my help and I can go to him for advice now and 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 knowing that those two that dyadic relationship may may evolve over time and letting it and, and also turning it on its, on, its, on its head at times when you think that one of your mentees could actually advise you, I think is really empowering for them as well. So I think that, that also managing up when you have a mentor who thinks they're still mentoring you and uh, they're not giving you anything that you need anymore, you need to you know, convert that over. Have the conversation, it's awkward, but I think you have to say, like I think we're more here now and not here anymore. This is where we started, but we've done this together. And because of your mentorship, because of your sponsorship, because of who you've been for me, I have gone further and faster than maybe I would have hoped. Um, but that means that our, our relationship is evolving now and having that conversation. Yeah, I think these are all excellent points. And, and really thinking about the flexibility of both seeking out different types of supportive relationships, and then like Dr. Chan was mentioning in terms of being flexible with how things change and, and just having the sort of the wherewithal to really advocate for yourself and, and recognize that things do change and then that's okay and that's actually probably proactive in your continued growth. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Chan now to talk about tips for success. All right, so um, I think one of the big things that I've spoken about a lot here is that idea that collaboration is actually really important. So thinking about how, um, how to team well, how to select a team, how to foster a team, how to connect a team. I think all of those things are really important things for um, being a person in the world. And then especially so in academics because at least, at least in the circles I run, academia is a team sport in, in the work that I do. It's not always so, right? Like uh, our colleagues in anthropology or law or uh, sociology, sometimes it's like max two authors. It is not a team sport there and I feel bad for them because I love having a great team behind me that, you know, like that has different roles and we all assemble in different ways to help augment each other. But I think you have to make sure that if you're gonna do collaboration, you have to have you know, clear roles, clear expectations, clear timelines and do all the things you would normally do for any other team. Uh, and you have to all agree on which way you're headed and do that together and obviously that comes with the baggage of when you disagree you have to have good conflict resolution skills, right? So that's all I think really important to c consider. I do also think that diversity actually matters and I think I've learned the most from people who are actually super not like me because I realized how much of my perspective on the world is shaded by my, my background, my upbringing, my ethnicity, my um, gender, all of those things. It's, it's nice to have someone who's like your polar opposite to ask you, why do you think that? And tell me more about that because I think that in having to communicate that you realize how your worldview is shaped by your experiences and how that might need to change. And I think for me it means also the other way around, being willing and able to mentor someone that doesn't look like me, doesn't sound like me, doesn't act like me because in doing so, you're adding to their diversity, right? Because I think that that also is important. So going both ways and thinking about 
how you have to respect the autonomy and the diversity of your mentees. You're not trying to copy and paste. If you want to copy and paste, I guess that's what children are for, I've heard. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no. <laughs> but you're not trying to like replicate someone. You're starting to take what they have and augment it with a little piece of yourself that they could then take and, 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 and do better than maybe you did it yourself. In terms of equity, I think that it's important to think about how you can actually then, if you achieve a position of power, throw down that ladder. We talk about like, you know, breaking the glass ceiling, but then when you see you're there, I think there's actually an imperative. And it's something that you can remind your peers in senior leadership that now that we're here, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to keep it the same way it's always been. In fact, the same way it's always been is probably a little bit broken. And I think that you have to send the message that it's important for us to make the system better than it was yesterday. People talk about quality improvement all day, every day in hospitals. You have to, you have to spin some of that into what we do on a regular basis, because I think it's important for us to think about how we can make the system better than it was yesterday. And right now, equity is a really important part of that, but it's always been a really important part of it. We just sometimes got a little complacent. And so calling out complacency, calling out like the lack of rigor in the thinking, and like, why do we do it that way? Well, it's because that's the way it's always been done. I'm like, did you just say that? You know that's the most dangerous phrase in the world, right? And then thinking about like going to the literature, figure out best practice, and like the world has evolved. There is more papers published every day. If we don't have the solution, we should go find it, right? Being able to call people out on that. If we're gonna do evidence-based medicine, we have to apply that everywhere. And right now there's a lot of evidence on equity, right? All right, so reflection. What are some tips for success when you're doing mentorship yourselves? Spin it around. We've talked about the advantage of being the mentor, but I'm gonna throw it to each one of you. What are some successful tips for you for supporting others? It doesn't have to be just mentorship, but what do you do? What's one trick and pearl that you have for making things better for people to come after? I don't know, this, this is probably really simple, but I think one of the first things that I try and do is just be available and responsive. I think sometimes a lot of relationships go awry because one of the two parties just isn't responsive and isn't available. And so I try and tell anybody that's working with me, either this is the beta, best way to get in touch with me. If I don't respond to your email, you know, within a day, like please just text me. Um, and I think that has helped a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree with what doctors uh, Jordan and Chan have said, I think um, one thing that has helped me is to um, be as, uh, how do I say, to avoid as much problem solving as I possibly can. Mm. It, it is like so tempting. To to, like, <laughs> We're doctors, right? <laughs> to come to, to me with some issue that's going on and for me to tell you like, this is what you should do. <laughs> and because that would work for me and that would work for my personality and who I am as a person, but not necessarily someone else. So, so it's really about leading someone to what they feel like is a comfortable solution and, and trying to guide them. That is, that is, that I think is a much more successful relationship when it comes to mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I like to ask like the, the mentee or whichever role they want to be, you know, like which role do you want me to play? Like, do you want me to be the advisor? Do you want me to be the mentor, the ally, the sponsor? Like what, what is it that you're asking of me just mm -hmm. so I can make sure I fit that role so that I'm not letting them down? Because I think that's really helpful. I also ask them uh, quite a few questions during our first meeting. We usually do like a walking <laughs> meeting somewhere outside because I like to be outside. But usually it's like, how often do you want to meet? Mm -hmm. You know, like, how long do you want those meetings to be? Do you want to send me what you want to talk about? Just so, and maybe it's just, I feel very awkward talking to people. So maybe that's just my compensation of being like, I'm going to come show up prepared and ready to go mm -hmm. for that. But I think it also uses that time to really you know, figure out. And sometimes, you know, some of my mentees, they just want to go on a walk and just like share their personal lives and what's going on. And that's perfectly fine because if that's what our, our goal is for that, then I'm absolutely happy with that. But if it's actually the intention is to like work on a project together or like, you know, be sponsored for a talk, right, or something like this, it's really helpful for me to know that in advance. So really trying to empower that person to, to you know, let, let me know, like, please, I'm here to serve you, so let me know what that looks like. I think that has been um, really helpful in the relationships I've been able to cultivate and also grow them as a person and grow myself as a person as well. Mm -hmm. A productivity hack is that I have a, a bookable calendar on Doodle now, which green lights anything that's not already booked. So my, there's one, one 
website that you can go to basically, one URL, it's in my email head footer, and if you want to book half an hour with me, you just book me like that in the Apple store, just what's available. <laughs> uh, it cuts down on back and forth, it makes me omni-available uh, for my mentees, and it saved my uh, admin person's life because she was like, there's too many one-on-ones, and I'm like, that's fine. So we worked on this, and it's, uh, it's actually been something that's been makes it easy for people. They don't have to ask too hard, plus they have to write down the agenda. So then I know what's coming up, and that's been very helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. At the end of the day, the logistics are that there's no one way, right? Like you can do, if you like emails and you like text messages, then you can go round for round, right? And if you don't have like 32 mentees, you don't need to be like the Apple store, right? It's just a scalability for me is, is the real issue. And so I'm trying to cut down on the back and forth because then I can fit more time in to actually do the mentorship, which is what I like, because I don't want to spend half an hour emailing people to figure out what part of the calendar is, works for both of us, and too many doodle pulls. This is a one way, and it's, it's just a way, way to do it, right? And so I think that it's about structuring that meeting, setting out some standard operating procedures around, like, like when you are a mentee, this is what I'm hoping you show up with, and this is what I'm hoping that I can do for you, but you can you know, adjust that, change that as you need to. And I think that, like, I think you can cover a lot in half an hour if you know exactly what you want to cover. So I think that everything you've said just totally knocks it out of the park. Um, and then sometimes you just do need that downtime where you're going for a walk or sharing a meal and having that conversation because some of that shared experience is, is what's rewarding about the mentorship experience as well. And then timing, I mean, it's really important to think about how often, how long, what platform. Are you cool with a phone call? Are you cool with, you know, does it have to be face-to-face? -to -face to, you know, like some people need that, right? Um, and whatever ne needs to be to make everyone safe. And obviously, like, there'll be some non-inferiority kind of, <laughs> like, I'm here. I'm going to do a mentorship meeting at, you know, right after this talk. Zoom's going to have to do. I'm not anywhere near where she is right now. <laughs> And I think that um, thinking about when you're doing your uh, mastermind meeting or your uh, mentorship meeting, I think you could go either way with this. Um, I think having a first one where people kind of like go in thinking about what they want and what they need and then having that first meeting um, and then having one really close trailing it within a week or two usually, but even a month just so that you book that next meeting while you're in the last meeting, and I think that really helps. And I think that upfront, doing a little bit more, especially, so a mastermind group is where you have like a whole bunch of people that are like probably around the same, so it's more peer mentorship, right? But the idea is that you're same rank, so let's say a whole bunch of program directors, a whole bunch of APDs, but at different shops, so that you're not actually a direct report to anyone and you can't really, like you could go across specialties as well, for instance, right? Like Shri might have a whole bunch of APD network at Duke, for instance, right? And so the idea was like, you can all whine about your program directors and it's psychologically safe because no one really cares about like your drama and your little, you know, pyramid of people. And I think that that's helpful to, to think about how you can leverage that. But I think that having actionable next steps and treating it like a real meeting um, helps you get more out of it. All right, and I think the next question is, when it comes to these meetings, how do you run them? Do you let the mentee run them? Do you run them? How, how do we go about it? I admit, I kind of let them start first because they obviously came wanting to say something, right? So I, I try to, because I know the time's limited, I usually kind of, you know, of course, like check in on their wellness and stuff, but then um, let them kind of lead it a little bit because I think otherwise it can go get derailed and, and so on. I really want them at the end of that time period to feel like it was, it met their needs. I know I've been in <laughs> mentorship meetings where afterwards I was like, I have to jump on the calendar and, and meet again, right? Because it didn't quite work out, you know, that we didn't accomplish what we wanted to. So I do try to empower them to, you know, to use that time to, to best serve them. Yeah, same. And I think the only caveat would be if, if I'm meeting with them out of concern for something. Um, someone came to me and said that they're concerned about this particular person, so then now, now I'm leading that meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They might not be able to perceive that, but I feel like I'm leading that meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, I agree. Um, the only thing I'll add is like I do I do expect them to come in with an agenda because I need some guidance as well to know how I can be best effective. So I do want them to come with an agenda of their needs. Mm -hmm. And if the, the other thing to think about would be if it's like a shared mastermind group, then are they having some rules of conduct to look out and make space for each other is important. Um, and because let's say if the four of us were having a mastermind group, I want to make sure that everyone's getting even airtime or that they're ceding their airtime. Because like, you know, it might be that, I don't know, I'm in distress and Jamie's like, you clearly need the time, let's, let's work on you. And then you fold that into another meeting, another time, right? And so I think you can evolve that as it goes, especially if it's a longitudinal experience that it doesn't have to be even airtime all the time. But please note that there's, there might be a member of the group who's just, just a little bit more introverted, a little bit more quiet and making space for them. Um, and, and kind of doing the mental math and, and having everyone look out for each other is really important and making sure that they do that. All right, I guess parting advice, because I think we're coming coming to the end of this. One, one, one quick tip from each of you. Mine is be, to just like be, be aware and kind of look out for people that you can like send out that ladder to. Because I think that, you know, in academics, it um, can feel like you're, you know, our colleagues can feel like they're walking alone, right? And so just kind of like being aware, because I think uh, oftentimes they may not see that you're available or they think you're too busy. I have four kids, so everyone thinks I'm too busy, but I'm like, I have time for you, right? I get very strategic with my time. So there, there's always time in my mind um, to stretch that 24 hours out. And so just being available to people and just really, you know, offering. And if you see someone who's struggling, really, you know, checking in with them and offering to meet with them, I think is, is another way to like empower them and be an ally for them to really help them through hard times. Cause I know we've all been through hard times ourselves and it's hard to walk that path alone. So just letting them know that they're not alone, I think is, is really a powerful thing to, to help them on their, on their journey. I have three kids and I'm intimidated by people who have four kids. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, but I will say, lower, lower, like it's important to not be afraid to reach out to people. I mean, you might get a lot of no's or no responses, and most of the time when you reach out to someone to ask for help, they're not going to be angry that you're asking for help. They might just say no because they don't have time or they're not the right fit for that particular need. But generally speaking, it's, uh, I mean, I think it's supposed to be like flattered or, or, or honored to help someone. Um, and so I would say lower any intimidation or fear you might have when it comes to reaching out for help. Mm -hmm. I, I love to help people, I'll be quite honest. So, I'm like, yeah. yeah, well, we're working our way down the kids because I only have two, so. <laughs> and, and that was enough. Um, but yeah, taking a, taking a note from Dr. Chan here, I think really just being authentic, showing yourself with all of your flaws and, and being realistic about what, the, what you can offer and when you need to seek outside, you know, outside assistance, I think is really important. And then again, I'm just going back to the whole, the, the simplistic of being responsive and available. I think that, that goes miles if you're just there. Mm -hmm. And I think my final thought would be that I think mentorship can be a two-way street and to think above you of the people who you might be able to, you might not call it mentorship, but I think it's just being helpful because I think that as you help other people, especially those who are maybe lonelier than you because they're a level above, right? Like when you're a PD, it might be your vice chair. When you're vice chair, it might be your chair. When you're in chair, it might be your dean. When you're a dean, it's probably the provost. And then like it just keeps going up, right? And so, I, I, but there's less and less people at the top. And so I find that leaders tend to be very lonely. And so if you can use your servant leadership to go both for those below you, but also to look up and say, how can I be helpful to those people? Sometimes they're the loneliness. And they can be great sponsors once you actually help them in your way. And so being a good team player also means mentoring up, showing someone how to use Twitter, you know. And it might be simple things like that that they couldn't have paid money to get someone to do or their kids were annoyed when they tried, right? So, um, and, and I think that your job is to, to see what you can do to, to help someone along their way. And it, it's, it's not always just rank. Sometimes it's just a person. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much, everyone.